Can I, can I get a bit? Uh, okay, uh, a one, two, three, woo, just to get the people out there who are getting the coffee and the bacon and everything else to consider coming in. One, two, three. All right. Folks down the hall, this is the time. We have got a packed day, and so we'd love to stay on schedule. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Thank you for rejoining us. Um, you know, the, I, I know it's tempting to go for those uh, early morning uh, strolls uh, through, uh, through the mall. Uh, and of course, for those of you who are not from the DC area, this is a, not the mall with the Banana Republic and all the stores, uh, but uh, here in the nation's capital, uh, it's a very different kind of mall. Uh, but again, we, uh, we knew, do know that we do have folks uh, who are not from the area, and we do have uh, uh, one person who's going to be joining us who is from very much outside the area. It is my pleasure to have joining uh, me up here in just one moment, Johan Prevost, the executive director of IPOPI, the international uh, patient organization uh, for primary immunodeficiencies. Uh, the Immune Deficiency Foundation is a member organization of IPOPI, uh, and Johan can, can tell you the more up-to-date stats uh, than I do uh, have about uh, all the member organizations. But IDF does and plays its role here in the United States. Meanwhile, there are a multitude of other organizations around the world who are grappling with uh, their own issues of access and um, uh, cultural and regional uh, issues that affect how PI is treated. And of all of the times that we have had state-based conferences and regional conferences and every other year a national conference, we have never had a talk like this. So it's very special and it is my pleasure to bring up to the stage uh, a great partner, a great friend to our community uh, and a leader internationally, Johan Pergo. Hello, everybody. So um, it's my first IDF national conference. <laughs> And, uh, and this is what I really love, the woo factor. <laughs> I, I think in Europe we should start to implement the woo factor. And I might ask you to woo more during the presentation because it's so much fun. Um, so for me, it's been a great, great um, conference. And I really want to thank uh, John and Marcia and the IDF team for pulling together such a great program, and I'm very thankful for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here. Um, so what I'm going to try to do in my slides is to give you um, a bit of a global perspective um, of what it is like to live with primary immunodeficiency in other countries in the world, and what are the main policy and challenges that our patient community um, is facing worldwide. So this is the table of contents of my uh, talk. Um, I'll say a few words on IPOPI, as I'm sure not everybody in the room uh, knows about IPOPI. And then I, give you, I will give you some global data on uh, patient priorities. And then I'll go into an overview of key policy development and challenges. Um, and then last but not least, I'll talk briefly about some of the support tools that we have in place to make sure that we support our patient organizations around the world. So IPOPI was established in 1992, and how many of you know the people pictured in this photograph? OK. It's not Clint Eastwood, and it's not Meg Ryan. It's, um, it's, it's Bob Levine and it's, and it's Marsha Ball. And this is a picture which I believe was taken in Oxford um, in 1990. And this was a very important meeting. It was the first time that patient organization leaders from around the world uh, gathered during the meeting of what was then known as the EGIT, or the European Group for Immunodeficiency, which is basically the equivalent uh, of CIS um, in the States. And 
Professor Helen Chappell, um, who is a, a key opinion leader in the field in the UK, um, had this idea jointly with uh, Bob and Marcia and a few others uh, to, put, to put together a meeting whereby the patient organizations could meet together. And two years later, um, the decision that emanated from this meeting uh, came to be realized, and that was the launch of iPoppy, um, formal launch in Switzerland in 1992. Since then, we've been working hard on raising awareness of uh, PID. Uh, so in Europe, we say PID. I know you say PI, so I'll, I'll try to say PI, so it doesn't get too confusing. But so improving awareness of PI, access to diagnosis and care worldwide for primary immunodeficiency patients. Super ambitious mission. It still gives us plenty of work today, uh, many years later. Uh, but they had the vision of creating this organization. And I think it's true to say that if uh, Marsha hadn't started IDF on her kitchen table, uh, she wouldn't have met Bob. And Bob wouldn't have had um, this idea to launch iPoppy. So in a way, uh, we here and I'm here also because of Marsha Boyd. I might pause after each slide so you can give me more woos. We'll see how, we'll see how that goes. Not going bad so far. Um, so you can see here uh, the map of the world. Any country in orange is a country that's a member uh, of iPoppy. So when we started, I can't remember, Mar Marcia probably knows, but probably it was seven, eight, maybe more uh, patient organizations when we, when we started iPoppy. And it's been grad a gradual process. So when I joined iPoppy 10 years ago, we had 27 members. Um, now we have 67, and we're looking into having more than 70 uh, by the end of this year, I hope. Um, what has also changed is the number of primary immunodeficiencies. So just when I started, there were less than 200 known forms of primary immunodeficiencies. No, they are more than 380. So this is a constantly evolving field, and we need to make sure that each country is equipped with an efficient national patient organization uh, to work on all the challenges we, we face. So today, IPOPI is working really at, at, at three different levels. We work on a global scale with partners like the WHO, the World Health Organization, we work at the regional level, um, but we're also starting to work at the national level any time a country needs our help. I think in the States, you are very well served by, by IDF, and IDF is certainly um, a great example for many other uh, of our national patient organizations. But you can imagine for patient organizations that started to work this year, and we have a couple, they need guidance, they need to hear about others, and we also are there for them. So these are our strategic objectives, four uh, strategic objectives. The one at the top is very important. It's improving access to diagnosis. We want to make sure PI patients are diagnosed promptly and they don't have to go through years of not being diagnosed and face infections and potential organ damage. And of course, with early diagnosis comes the opportunity for appropriate care. So that's a major objective. Awareness, awareness of PI, awareness of IPOP and all work, and of course, support to the national member organizations. And all of these three objectives are really supported by the one at the bottom of the slide, which is stakeholder collaboration. Um, so we put a lot of importance on making sure every time we start a program or a meeting that we think hard about who we should involve, who we should bring in to work jointly with us. That's a picture of our board. So I think you know also the gentleman on the right-hand side um, of the picture is your current uh, chairman. And, and John has joined uh, iPoppy already a, a couple of years ago. And um, we have a great board. You can see the countries of each of the board members. I think we have a truly global board representing each region of the world. And as you can see, our staff, well, it's smaller than the IDF staff. We, we're not that many to cover the world, but I think we manage to do our work because we have so many great volunteers on the board, but also in our national member organizations that help us to carry out our mission. So now some global data. Um, first thing I want you to, to take away from this talk is that if we look at PI, 
on a worldwide scale, it's currently estimated that 70% to 90% of PI patients still remain undiagnosed. So this is a huge number of people that are out there and they don't know they have PI and no one knows they have PI and you can imagine what that's like. Often the cause for that is that PI is just not known. Um, doctors don't learn about PI during their curriculum in many countries. Um, we don't have clinical immunologists uh, established um, as a specialty in many countries. And unfortunately for many of our patients worldwide, uh, they will not get a diagnosis or they will go really through years without one. Yet we know that early diagnosis leads to lower healthcare costs. So we know we have a good story. We know that we need to diagnose them and we know that it'd be better not only for the patients but for the healthcare system as well. And of course with no newborn screen being available um, for severe forms of PID like SCIT, we know patients should be detected at an, early, at an early stage to save lives. So this is a very recent slide. We just made it right before um, the meeting because just in the last couple of months, two countries in Europe have announced that they will start screening for SCIT uh, nationwide. That's Germany and Sweden. Um, we also have Norway. <clears throat> So we get in there, I think, um, again, you know, I think the campaign that IDF started and now you've, you, you're screening for all newborns uh, in the U.S., that has been an impetus for other regions and other countries to start working on it. And so we've tried to implement the IDF campaign model in these countries. It's moving slowly, but with Norway as well, um, Iceland and Switzerland, uh, I think things will, will evolve. The lighter blue um, countries are countries where we have uh, regional or pilot programs currently ongoing, or perhaps it's a state in the country that's doing newborn screening, so it, it hasn't been applied nationwide, but they're on the way. And those with the stars are those that are starting pilot studies. So you can see, still a lot of countries in white, and that means we have a lot of work, uh, but we get in there. So if we now move um, towards some global policy developments, I don't know how many of you knows about the World Health Organization list of essential medicines. So this is a list that basically includes any medicinal uh, product that is supposed to be meeting a basic healthcare need. And that any country in the world should put in place and should make available uh, for the patients in that given country. Now, IPOPI in 2003 um, started a campaign to reinstate IG therapies in the list of essential medicines. IG therapies had been included in the list, but in 2003, the expert committee of the WHO concluded they were no longer essential medicines. And they came up with a very awkward justification. I still remember it. They said other vaccine products are available. Right? I mean, that makes no sense. And it's a decision coming from an expert committee. The problem is that the expert committees, these experts, they're not experts in everything. They can't be experts in every medicinal product. So that, you can imagine, created an outrage in the community, and IPOPI, IDF, many others sent letters to the WHO asking for a reinstatement. It didn't work. And in 2005, IGs were still out of the list. So what we realized at that point is that we need to work together. And IPOPI teamed up with the International Union of Immunological Societies, IUIS. And with the support of many others, IDF, the Latin American Society for Immunodeficiencies, and all of the stakeholders, we submitted a joint dossier with a lot of data, it took a lot of work, and guess what? Immunoglobulins were reinstated in the list. <clears throat> and so, so that was very important, and that list is particularly important for countries in the developing world where you really need to convince governments why they should cover for immunoglobulin therapies. But what's very interesting as well 
is that it's not only about the product, it's about the indications. So the list of the WHO states that these are essential medicines for priority conditions selected on the basis of current and estimated future public health relevance and potential for safe and cost-effective treatment. And it's PI and Kawasaki disease. So we know that immunoglobulins are essential for this community and it's clearly stated. And that's a huge support tool for us to advocate. Now, more recently, the WHO has announced the launch of a list of essential diagnostic tests. The first version was launched, we weren't aware, and when we found out about that, we looked into it and we realized, okay, this is a list to really include essential diagnostics for infectious diseases. You know, the WHO works a lot on outbreaks and, and, and so on. But then, talking to the WHO, they said, well, actually, we're starting to, to change a little bit our thinking, and we're thinking we should probably include chronic disorders uh, diagnostics in this list. So we started a very similar campaign than what we did a few years ago for the essential medicines list. We teamed up again with the regional societies, with the national societies, and I don't know if Kathleen Sullivan is in the room, uh, but I want to say a big thank you to, to her because she was actually uh, of tremendous help to put together the application dossier. So we're very grateful to her. Right now, we don't know whether we have been successful. I was frantically going through the WHO website yesterday at 11 p.m. because we, we are awaiting the decision any day. So for all you know, uh, on Monday, we, we will know. Uh, but we're very hopeful that PI diagnostic tests will be included. And once again, imagine how great that's going to be for all these countries where you have such low diagnosis rates. We can now start advocating for PI diagnosis. And that's fantastic. Now, I also wanted to bring your attention to the fact that um, just four months ago, in the US, in New York, at the United Nations headquarters, um, there was a, a meeting called the uh, NGO Committee for Rare Diseases. Now, this is a very um, interesting development, and IPOPI is involved into this. Um, essentially, for the first time, the United Nations is now looking at rare diseases as a priority area within their strategic plan to 2030 and their sustainable development goals. So the idea here is to implement universal healthcare coverage in the world, in every UN member state, and to make sure that specific provisions are made for rare diseases conditions. Now that obviously opens up the door for PI. Because after all, we represent a significant portion of these rare disorders, 380. That's amazing. So we want to make sure at IPOPI that we can leverage on these sort of developments. And we've contributed and supported a position paper called Leave No One Behind in Universal Health Coverage. So this is again a current global policy development that the community will be able to use um, to defend PI priorities. So if we look overall at our global policy challenges, we know that one of the key challenges is how do we translate what's happening at the global scale into the countries. And this is why we have programs in place where we help our national member organizations to do that. We still know that developing world countries are, are still miles away from meeting essential patient needs. So we need to use these WHO tools and we need to get involved with the WHO to make sure that we change that. And of course, that can only be done if we've got strong national patient organization and good collaboration with doctors and other stakeholders. So you've heard John probably talking a lot about the world needs more plasma. It's a great slogan. I was thinking we could also say, let's make plasma great again. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's a, it's, it's a great, great slogan, and it points to an important problem. We've seen that Ig demand, the demand for immunoglobulin, 
has been steadily growing. It grows about 9% per year. 9% per year. To be able to meet that demand, we need to collect more plasma. If we don't have more plasma, we're not meeting the demand. We also know that right now, this country is great at collecting plasma. So you collect about 60% of the global plasma supply in the United States. But what does that mean? It means other regions have to start collecting more. And if other regions collect more, it's good for all PI patients. It's not only good for non-US patients, it's good for all patients because we're talking about global therapies. We're talking about global therapies that need to travel. If, a, if an Ig treatment is produced in Germany and is really good for you as an American citizen, you want to make sure you access that and vice versa. At the same time, history has taught us that relying on a national self-sufficiency model for plasma doesn't work. Look at the UK. A few years ago, we had the MADCO disease crisis. Do people remember? about that and the VCJD, so this was a new virus and it disrupted the whole plasma supply chain in the UK so much that to this day UK plasma cannot be used to manufacture uh, plasma products including immunoglobulin. So I hope it never happens but imagine if something happens to the US supply. Imagine if suddenly American plasma can no longer be used. Well, it's happened in the UK, so we have to be careful about that. I think good measures are in place, but this is just to say we should look at plasma supply as a global problem, and we need to collect more of it. So this is a slide from the Marketing Research Bureau, um, which is a, a specialist agency that compiles data on the plasma products market, and it just shows you very clearly the growing demand for IG worldwide and the expected growth in the years to come. So there is absolutely no question that everybody, everybody expects that the IG market will continue to grow and therefore we need to collect more plasma. If we now go at the regional level, and by the way, John uh, or Marsha or whoever, if I'm going over time, you stop me. Uh, I talk a lot, I know. <laughs> um, so in the EU, we've been quite active with IPOPI uh, at the uh, European Parliament level. We organize meetings there and we make sure that the priorities of our patient communities are taken into account in any new policy or law coming about in the EU. We've been working a lot on newborn screening. I've mentioned that. But we've also been able to use the attention that the EU has given rare diseases to fund specific programs for PI. So, for example, two of the programs we are participating actively in are programs that are put in place with EU funding to come up with new gene therapy licensed product. So one of them is called SkidNet, and that's looking specifically at X-linked SKID, and Recomp specifically looks at RAG1 Skid. And these programs are clear opportunities for communities. So once again, it's using this buzz around rare diseases and funding opportunities to make sure we carve out specific actions for PI. We've also been working with a group called PLUS, the platform of plasma protein users in the, in the States. You've got A+, and I believe John is an active member of A+, and this is basically a platform that brings together the PI community, the hemophilia communities, alpha-1 antitrypsin, and so on. Basically, any patient community that depends on a stable supply of plasma products. And by working together, we've been able to achieve great things in Europe. One of the big problems we have in Europe is that many European countries think that paying, for, paying plasma donors for their donation is wrong. And what we say in as patients is that let's look at the facts. Let's look at where the plasma comes from. 60% of the world plasma comes from paid donors. Germany and Austria have started to pay plasma donors. And what's interesting is that these two countries are collecting a huge portion of EU plasma. So we don't think it's wrong 
to pay plasma donors as long as it's done within the regulatory framework and to make sure that the safety of donors is respected and the safety of products is guaranteed. But we need to change some of these ethical beliefs. And our key message has been shift the ethical debate from compensating pain or not pain donors to what do patients need. We need to make sure that the interest of patients is put at the center of all of these discussions. So if we go to the next slides, I think despite all these posit positive policy developments, we know that we have still challenges remaining. We know we need to tackle diagnosis and tre treatment disparities between different countries. And we've seen a shift between what we would like to promote, which is a patient-centered approach to care, to a payer-centered approach. That means that we defend the interest of the patients, but many countries' decisions are driven by the payers, and they just want to go for the cheaper products. They don't really want to meet all demand for choice and access. So we need to close that gap, and that's a big, big mission. And it's not only in Europe, it's worldwide. We need to do that on a worldwide basis. So I just wanted to briefly mention that the Council of Europe has issued a set of recommendations. So for those who are not, of you who are not acquainted with the EU, we've got the EU institutions, and that's a set of institutions who govern the EU. But then we have the Council of Europe, that's a much wider body. It covers more countries, it covers non-EU member states, and they also have their action. And you can see in bold, uh, we have obtained from them uh, uh, through participation in their meetings with other experts, that they issue a set of recommendations that clearly state that all recognized routes of IG administration should be made available to patients and that IG products differ from one another. This is what we believe. So we need to make sure that we use that. Uh, but as I said, we, we, we know that we have challenges uh, remaining and we know that member states like France, for example, are really strongly opposing uh, paying plasma donors and, and compensating for, for plasma donation. So we need to work on all that. I just wanted to briefly mention the case of Romania. This is an EU member state, and for tax-related reasons on pharmaceutical products, there was a shortage of immunoglobulin products um, a couple of years ago. And it actually resulted in one of our patients dying for not being able to access her Ig treatment. Now, well, this is just not acceptable in the EU. We just can't have that. And so IPOPI worked hard with our member organization in Romania to restore the situation. I'm glad to say that in 2019, the situation is gradually coming back to normal. But that points to a big problem. We should never get comfortable. We don't know what can happen tomorrow in terms of policymaking. And even if you've got it good in a country, you should, you should stay really vigilant about these sort of developments. The UK is also an interesting case. Um, I think the UK, the approach has been very much payer-centered in the last couple of years. So they've had a reduction in IG products being commissioned, and they view viewing IG therapies as generics. And now, of course, they have Brexit, which is complicating everything uh, further. So if we move for Asia, and I talked about the differences between um, access to treatment between regions. This is a very interesting slide. If you look on your left, you can see the world population by region. Look at Asia and, and, and Pacific region. That's close to 60% of the world population. And on your right is how much of the plasma products get to them, in blue as well. So you can see 60% of the world population, but less than 20% of plasma products. So that's a clear imbalance, and we need to restore that. And I'm pleased to say that um, we have been an active member of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation. Now, this is a platform that takes care of many broad social economic matters in the Asia-Pacific region, but they have a specific remit on healthcare. And within that healthcare action, they have created 
the Blood Policy Committee. So this is a committee that is really looking at policies for the supply and the collection of blood and plasma. This is a great committee for us to be involved and we want to make sure that from the start, we start talking about PI to these decision makers and we can hop on that boat and, and work more efficiently at national level. So you can see Bob again here. I, I just want to mention briefly that we are very thankful to Bob, not only for creating iPoppy, but for a few years ago, he came to one of our meetings in Florence in, in 2012, and he came to me after one of my presentations, a bit like this one, and he told me, Johan, you haven't talked much about Asia. What's iPoppy doing in Asia? Uh, well, I mean, you know, we have work here and there, Japan and India. And, yeah, what about Southeast Asia? Well, well, we don't really do anything. And why? Well, we don't, we don't have the funds to do it. We, we can't get funding. It seems like no one is very interested. We would like to, but we can't. So he gave us a financial donation to kickstart the program. And without that financial donation, we wouldn't have started. Now, five years later, we've got a patient organization in most of East Asian countries. And that's really thanks, thanks to Bob. So I really wanted to thank him and mention that. And just to give you a quick example, Vietnam, we didn't have anything in Vietnam. First meeting we did was in 2015. What we learned in that meeting is that for a 90 million population, they had diagnosed 70 patients. That's not many. IG was only covered for patients until the age of six, then partially covered until they're 18, and then once you're 18, well, presumably you're fixed because the government doesn't pay for your treatment anymore. So we've been launching a patient organization. We've been working hard with them. And now you can see that we have, in three years, almost tripled the number of patients. So 200 patients for a 90 million countries is not much, but tripling the number in a matter of years in a country that is poorly equipped from an infrastructure standpoint, it's a very good key indicator that things are moving in the right direction. And you can see that along with more patients being diagnosed, they've been able to advocate for more coverage for, for immunoglobulin therapies. And today, they cover these costs until age 18. And then they, they provide partial reimbursement for adult patients as well. And it depends on your economic status, so it's not perfect, but what a difference in just a matter of a few years. So, <clears throat> silence. Give me a woo, please. <laughs> so, you know, we have, we have these challenges. Latin America, um, perhaps some of you have attended lecture by Professor Antonio Condino Neto, uh, who is at the meeting. And Antonio has been a great leader uh, for many years of the Latin American society. And together with him, we launched a call for action um, a couple of years ago. And Latin America, again, is a very diverse region, uh, confronted by very diverse uh, problems. Just yesterday, we were talking about Colombia and the fact that immunoglobulins uh, are not readily available and that there are no immunologists. So again, this is a, a region, but I wanted to mention very briefly the case of Puerto Rico. Now, Puerto Rico, obviously, uh, a special uh, place uh, for the US, uh, but also a special place um, because they went through such a horrific uh, experience in 2017 with Hurricane Maria. And we just were godsmacked about what our national member organization did. Imagine that after the hurricane, 95% of the population in, the, in Puerto Rico had no electrical power. Only 15% of the airports were functioning. And three months later, only 50% of schools, banks, and government offices were functioning. And even to the stage of one year later, 1% 1 of the population had no electricity. The patient group, the Immune Deficiency Foundation in Puerto Rico, was amazing. They reached out to their members to make sure they were okay, to make sure they were still alive, to understand their needs. They partnered with the hospital, with the treatment centers to try to reaccess treatment and assess the situation. 
They even provided food, basic needs, and medicines to their members. And they used the worldwide campaign, World PI Week, to reestablish their network. Now, if that's not sticking up for your patient population, I don't know what is. And it's just a great example of going the extra mile. So I'm very conscious of time. I have a few more slides, but I'll speed up a little bit just to talk about Africa uh, briefly. Um, two examples. South Africa, this is a country which historically has been probably a little bit better off in terms of accessing Ig therapies and diagnosis than many other countries in the region. But unfortunately, due to a change in their reimbursement policy in the last year, patients have been forced to switch to an older generation product that's produced locally and that has a lot of side effects compared to the, the more modern forms um, of Ig treatment. So much so that some patients decided to discontinue their treatment. So South Africa is really facing a major crisis when it comes to a shortage of immunoglobulin. And we are working hard with our patient organization to really change that situation. In contrast, Kenya, where there was nothing being done for primary immunodeficiencies just a couple of years ago, they've just launched a patient organization. They've worked on their first educational congress for doctors. They've established a PID support group for their patients. And they work hand in hand with their doctors to make the future better uh, for patients in their country. And so you can see that we go back and forth. It may be better in a country, then it becomes less good, and we work again, and then we help another. And it's a constant effort to try to bring everybody at the same level. So these are my last slides. I just wanted to briefly mention that the way we support, I've talked about support a lot. So the way we support our national member organization, first of all, we have programs. We have skills building workshops. We organize every two years our global patients meeting, the GPM. And this is a great meeting where patient leaders from around the world can meet with each other. And it breaks the isolation because they can meet with people from their region that are facing the same problems, but they can meet people like John, like Marcia from other world regions that have a different set of experience and, and they can learn from each other. And this is just a great event uh, every two years. It's also an event where we reward our champions. So we want to reward those that lead by example. And well, 2018 was really the most American uh, <laughs> ceremony we, we ever had because Marcia Ball won the Labine Award, which basically rewards uh, an international patient advocate that has made a huge difference to PI patients worldwide. So Marcia got that. And then we have the Luciano Vassali Award, which is named after Luciano Vassali, who sadly passed away when he was in his teenage years in Switzerland, but had been a, a hugely active young advocate uh, for PI patients in Switzerland. So the Luciano Vassali Award is always very special. It's always an extremely difficult process to just give it to one young person. Uh, because obviously all of our young advocates are doing a wonderful job. But I'm pleased to report that uh, we had another American winner, and that was Madison Shaw, uh, pictured at the bottom here. So that was very nice. I can't promise we will do that every time, but that was nice for the US. And so we also organize these sort of meetings at the regional level. We train patients. You can see some pictures from our skills building advocacy workshop, the last one we did in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur. And this is really trying to equip our patient leaders with the tools, with the know-how of how to go about advocacy. Because not everybody knows about advocacy. And when you lead in a group from a purely volunteer basis, you may not have the professional background to know how to go about it. So making sure you can learn and get trained on this is very important. We also have this great worldwide campaign called the World Primary Immunodeficiency Week. This is again a multi-stakeholder campaign and doctors, patient groups, nurses alike participate in that. So far we have 
been able to support over 130 national campaigns um, in all world regions, and this is just a great momentum every year taking place from 22nd to 29th of April. And I think this is one of my last slides to show you that part of what we also do, I talked about the importance of education, of raising the awareness among the medical community. And a few years ago, we launched our clinical care scientific conference. And what we're trying there is to promote better clinical management of primary immunodeficiencies. And this has been a very successful program. We also have a program called PI Detect, which specifically trains doctors from developing world countries on diagnostic tests for PID so they can go back to their country and share the knowledge that they acquire uh, during these meetings, uh, these programs. And then we have webinars and, and workshops, so a range of programs are available. So to conclude, I think we can say that today the world is a better place for PI patients than it was when it all started in 1992. We know significant advances have been made in terms of diagnostics and novel therapies, and more to come. We're working actively on many research, exciting projects. IPOPI has expanded its activities significantly, but despite this, when we look at the worldwide scale, we know a large majority of patients still do not have access or have poor access to the life-saving treatments they need. We're facing recurrent supply tensions with IG therapies, and there's a need to put in place demand management mechanisms to prioritize access to IG therapies for PI patients. And so we need to work with our stakeholders to collect more plasma. I just wanted to briefly mention the PPTA campaign, the How Is You Day campaign, which is designed to promote the importance of plasma donors. And I think we don't make enough noise in the world about the importance of plasma donors, and we, we certainly should do that. So well done, well done to PPTA to start um, such a great campaign. And of course, the ultimate goal is to ensure global self-sufficiency. I mean, that's our mission. We want to make sure that in the future, every PI patient can be diagnosed and can have access to treatment. Probably not in my lifetime, but I hope we will be much further uh, than we are at the moment. And I think we need to be clever. We need to be pragmatic, and we need to look at where are our opportunities uh, in terms of international policy developments to make sure we can carve out specific actions for PID. And I've mentioned a couple like the United Nations or the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. So to conclude, IPOP is committed to further increase its action on behalf of all PID patients through collaboration with its stakeholders. And with that said, and with three minutes and a half delay, I say thank you, and I hope to see some of you uh, at our future conferences. Thank you very much.